Good morning or good afternoon, Brian. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Steve. Good to see uh, you. Well, uh, I want to welcome everyone to the Atlanta Aero Club webcast speaker series. Uh, this is our six webcast uh, that we've been doing uh, to replace our temporarily our in-person luncheons at, at the Capital City Club downtown, which uh, everyone enjoys. And the webcast series has been very uh, well received. And uh, what it does is it gives us uh, access to people that we really want to talk to that might not be able to join us in Atlanta. And today, we have a tremendous program with you. We have our guest speaker is Brian Wynn, and he is the president of AUVSI. And, and Brian, don't faint. I said it correctly that time. So, <laughs> uh, and so the Atlanta Aero Club, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, is a chapter of the National Aeronautics Association uh, out of Washington, D.C., and, and uh, mutual friend Greg Principato, friend of Brian's as well, and, and mine is the president of that group, which goes back to 1907, and also administers the Collier Trophy, amongst other uh, awards, to recognize uh, uh, the latest accomplishments in the aviation and aerospace world. Uh, our uh, particular chapter was established in 1984 here in Atlanta. So this is our 37th year to uh, promote aviation in all its forms in our region and to uh, promote the benefits of uh, aviation in the business and personal world for everyone. Uh, special thanks today to our sponsors for this uh, year, for this program series, and that would include Gulfstream Aerospace, uh, Mark Burns, uh, President, thank you, sir. Uh, Delta Airlines, Ed Bastian, John Lauder, Glenn Howenstein, thank you very much. Uh, Epps Aviation, Pat Epps, and uh, uh, Marion and Elaine, and uh, Patrick, thank you. And EYS Communications, uh, which is uh, our marketing group, which does our promotions here at the Atlanta Aero Club. And uh, you can find them on the internet. They do a wonderful job for us, and I highly recommend them. I also would like to uh, shout out to Ad Buyer. Uh, limited, uh, which produces AvBuyer magazine right here that you may see at many FBOs. And if you're in a corporate flight department, you get this already. This goes to every flight department in the world every month. So if you have a marketing need, uh, please let us know. So today, uh, our format is uh, uh, Brian has a lot of information he's going to share with us. And uh, we had a wonderful two-hour talk last week that I, I wish we could share with you as well, because it was tremendous. And, and uh, Brian also has, has an amazing video. You just stand by for this video. You're going you're gonna to love it. If you have a question, uh, please add to our chat room uh, uh, question line, which is uh, the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Type it in, and at the end of Brian's presentation, we'll, we'll cover those questions. So, uh, Brian, I'm going to introduce you. Uh, I'm going to read some of your, your background and uh, get, get this launched. Uh, Brian Wynn is the president and CEO of the Association of Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. Uh, AUVSI, the world's largest nonprofit organization dedicated to the advancement of unmanned systems and robotics. Brian is a member of several committees and initiatives that aim to push the unmanned systems industry forward, including the Drone Advisory Committee, DAC, which is a group of key decision makers formed by the, our friends at the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. And by the way, welcome to our friends from the FAA that are joining us today. We're very uh, honored to have you here. And uh, at his discussion today will include safe introduction of unmanned aircraft systems into the uh, nation's airspace, an overview of AUVSI's work, a preview of X potential 2021, which is his uh, trade show, and the future of unmanned vehicles, and the latest FAA rules. Uh, so, so you know, Brian is one of us. He is an instrument-rated pilot with for more than 20 years, and I'm extremely jealous because he is a Cicada Trinidad to fly, which is a beautiful airplane. 
as all of you know. And he's also one of the early recipients of Part 107 Remote Pilot Certificate, which, by the way, you can get that course at King Schools as well, and, uh, and a recent recipient of his Commercial Pilot Certificate, which I assume to be a uh, drone or Part 107. Before joining AUVSI, Brian was the president and CEO of the Electric Drive Association. So he is well versed in uh, autonomous powered systems like this. So Brian, without further ado, I'll drop off and uh, the, for, the floor is yours. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Steve. I'm honored to be here to address the Atlanta Aero Club and those joining from other locations. Uh, thanks to the, the, the miracles of the internet and Zoom. Um, I'm coming to you from my home in Reston, Virginia. Uh, and uh, uh, it was actually, uh, I began my tenure in 2015. My first unmanned systems show was uh, my coming out party, if you will, was held in Atlanta. Uh, and it was there that we actually unveiled uh, the new name that we've been traveling under for our trade show exponential and uh, and i'm pleased to announce that we're coming back to atlanta in august so a little bit more on that later i am a member of the washington dc aero club and frankly any other aviation oriented establishment that will have me as a member um, and i want to give my uh, shout out as well to my good friend greg principato um, who uh, from naa who was kind enough to uh, to, to, I think he's joined us. I think he's in the house and he was kind enough to, to send a note out to, to folks about uh, this, uh, this event. So Greg, thank you. And uh, always great to be uh, collaborating with you. Uh, we've already talked about AUVSI. Uh, just to add a little bit more color to that, we have members from over 60 countries and uh, they come from industry, of course, but also government and academia, we're a hybrid organization. You can be an individual member. Uh, we also have organizational members as well. Uh, and you know, the idea here is to uh, is is to open our arms and embrace as many folks in this community as we can. It's not really an industry per se. It's more of a community that that I think AUBSI represents, and uh, uh, and a very rich one at that. Unmanned technology started in the defense realm. Uh, it's the, probably the easiest way to think about it and has expanded very rapidly to the to commercial and civil applications. Uh, our members are serving and driving adoption across uh, not only uh, all three of those areas, but you know, think about it in terms of many vertical industry segments that are uh, very, very interested in this technology. Um, because of our common interest in aviation, Today, I will focus my remarks on unmanned systems in the air domain uh, and, and how that use is rapidly evolving. But AUVSI, although we started it on the air side back in 1972, uh, we've, we've also expanded our, uh, our, our work programs to the maritime domain and the ground domain as well. So, uh, and some of the most interesting analytics that we've got about our community demonstrate that more and more of the people that are uh, involved in AUVSI are operating in more than one of those domains or applications that that are, are being supported in more in one of those more than one of those domains or, or in one of the enabling technologies that works across the different domains. Um, UAS are, are playing a very critical role, I think, already. And uh, we think they're certainly game changers for many industries in the future. Uh, and uh, I would invite you to think about that as disruption, but in a very positive way. I'd like to say I could credibly predict the future of UAS, which is kind of my task today. Uh, extrapolating current trends are easy enough. I'm an economist by training, but making predictions about UAS can be a little bit hazardous, as I found out, uh, even in the six years that I've been involved. Um, my bio might be a little bit out of date here. I've been an aviator for almost 30 years now, and I think this is a really fascinating time to be in aviation. I can hear you asking, well, when is it, fa when is it not fascinating to be involved in aviation? And that's a fair question. Maybe it's just the speed of innovation and the convergence 
uh, that we're seeing of a lot of new technologies all at once uh, that's making this such an interesting moment. Steve um, already teased my uh, video, so I'm going to show that to you now. And this will be for a little bit of fun, but also there's a point. Uh, this gentleman, you can see he's got his car keys in his hand. He's got a choice. He can go to get pick up his sandwich for lunch uh, using his car the old fashioned way. Um, or he's got this new device that um, nah, he's not going to use the car. He's going to fly there. And he's going to fly there in a bathtub. Now, it, I'm not sure which of the uh, Mickenbecker uh, twins is actually the pilot in this video. It's either Johannes or Philippe. These guys, uh, in addition to being absolute super MacGyvers, um, you know, they're you can tell they're they're just real aviators. I mean, just look at the way they've designed this vehicle and pay special attention to the fact that he's put foam rubber on the bottom of his bathtub. Uh, to ensure that he has a safe and comfortable landing. Um, I, I know that we, I, in, an, in an earlier presentation, I put this video up in, basically in, uh, in, in sequence with some of the earlier, uh, or I should say earliest video that we have filming of, uh, of the Wright brothers era when um, people were doing very interesting things and innovative things with flying machines and figuring things out. You can also see if you watch the video carefully uh, that he's a formation flyer because there's a drone that's taking video footage. I think there might even be more than one. And I cut this video off because I, I didn't I, I didn't want to horrify our, our FAA colleagues um, too badly. But in truth, he, he doesn't land here. He actually, um, he, he, but he does throw up quite a bit of water and mud with uh, uh, when he guns the power and, and gets back to altitude uh, to, uh, to complete his flight over to, um, uh, to the bakery shop. So uh, really interesting video, which, you know, again, entertaining, but and, and reminiscent in some ways of the innovation that we've always seen in aviation. But it's also a harbinger. And to me, this is actually a video from 2018 and a bit of a harbinger for what we're now in fairly regular conversation about in, in, the, in the context of urban air mobility. It's, it's a very short jump from, it turns out, from UAS, which clearly benefited from faster, better uh, electric motors. Um, and that was my previous job, uh, promoting electric transportation, uh, electric drive transportation, uh, more energy dense batteries, faster processor speeds, more elegant software, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yet you still have the same challenges when you put all those things together and start flying around uh, in a bathtub. You know, now you're an aircraft in the airspace and, and here we go. Uh, but it kind of makes my point that you know, this, is, this is opening up some very, very radical new ways to move people and goods. And there are ways that are potentially more efficient more safe, more cost-effective, and more environmentally friendly ways. Uh, so um, I think it's very, very uh, interesting, and, and obviously you're interested in it as well uh, because you're here today. It's also forcing us to think differently about the way airspace is designed and certainly regulated. Um, and UAS are not the only new entrants into the airspace, of course. Uh, commercial space, uh, which has massively increased the cadence uh, of, of its launch schedule uh, is, is very much on the rise. Of course, supersonic aircraft are making a comeback, hypersonic, you know, beyond that, uh, which is very, very interesting. Uh, and, um, and, and so, you know, I think about this as someone who, who basically works with colleagues at the FA, with partners at the FA. This is uh, things that really are demanding more and more of the regulators' time and resources, and not just the FAA, obviously CAAs all around the world. Um, so there better be a good reason why we want to embrace this technology. Now, it's been very interesting during uh, this time where we've had to be socially distanced, 
it turns out that unmanned systems have actually played from strength. And I want to just, you know, we, we, we've had the moniker drones for good uh, for quite some time now. Um, and, you know, there's also some very, very good activity that's been underway in Atlanta for many years uh, that I've been paying attention to, again, because um, I kind of started in many respects in Atlanta. Um, so I mentioned that these are important tools for our warfighters. They continue to be, uh, they continue to uh, increase the situational awareness for our warfighters and keep them out of harm's way. Uh, from an economic standpoint, um, we're enhancing business operations, productivity, and importantly, we're enhancing safety as well. From a safety standpoint, uh, there's you know, the fastest growing segment adopting UAS uh, in their operations is public safety, uh, allowing them to be more efficient in their search and rescue operations, in wildfire tracking and, and fighting wildfires, wildland fires in surveying disaster sites. Uh, these are all very, very important improvements. Uh, and, and we've actually got uh, a counter on how many lives have been saved. As I mentioned, the pandemic, uh, you know, we saw really interesting examples of how UAS can be utilized in this environment. Uh, and, and it's certainly played from strength, um, not, not as something that would solve the pandemic, it's clearly a, a health issue, uh, but you know, in, in how do we address situations where we need to keep people away from one another, where we need to uh, where we need to basically learn how to sanitize things, and it was right there in your home uh, stadium uh, for Mer Mercedes Benz Stadium uh, for the Atlanta Falcons and the Atlanta United FC, where uh, we first saw the use of drones for uh, sanitation purposes of a sports venue. That's now been going on all over the place. Uh, I most recently interviewed a gentleman actually in, in the baseball world, Don Wakamatsu, who is the bench coach for the uh, Texas Rangers and, uh, and, and also grew up on a farm. And he has started to use drones uh, through a foundation of his to, uh, to, do, the, the, uh, to do the sanitation of their stadium. Uh, in uh, in Texas, uh, actually, right now they're doing it at spring training in in the Phoenix, Arizona area. So you can cut down a lot of time in disinfecting seats and handrails and you know glass partitions. You know as much as ninety five percent. That's just a simple example. Um, and in the Atlanta area and nationwide, we've been using drones to deliver prescriptions, medical devices, some instances life saving organs, and COVID nineteen tests. Uh, in Atlanta itself, uh, one of my favorite examples to point to, and I'm sure you're probably well aware of it, uh, is how CNN has been using UAS for years to report the news. Uh, shout out to my good friend, Greg Agvent, who I serve with on the Drone Advisory Committee, which, uh, which Steve mentioned. Um, he's been a leader uh, in, this, in this particular world and how to do that and how to do it safely. So, um, so kudos to them. There's a great partnership too between uh, the Georgia, Georgia Tech Advanced Technology Development Center, T-Mobile and Curiosity Lab to build a 5G incubator. And um, I'm watching that very closely. 5G obviously gonna be deployed first in urban areas and that's going to be a great enabler of drone technology particularly, and others like urban air mobility and so forth, um, as well as unmanned systems on the ground uh, as we move forward. So um, very, very important uh, developments that are, that are going on and being pushed right in your backyard. So what is AUVSI as a community organization? What are we doing to accelerate this progress into the future? Well, AVSI at, at, at its root is an advocacy organization, and um, an advocacy is is um, it's fundamental is education, uh, and its targets generally uh, our targets are generally legislators who are looking at policy and setting laws for the future. Obviously, our regulators we're working with them all the time. So there's the regulatory leg to the stool, and then the media as well. There's uh, the number one challenge that we will have as a community in getting 
widespread adoption of unmanned systems is public acceptance. So making sure that people understand the benefit and the value of these uh, systems is really, really important. And we're working, of course, at the state, the federal, and increasingly on the international level as well. The point that I would make, and I'm making to my colleagues all the time, is no technology is successful in reaching the mainstream if it's not executed well. I've already talked to the fact that there's a huge economic pull here, uh, but we have to execute this well. That means we would need to work together and, and make sure that we're doing this right. Um, and our guiding principles, I'll, I'll just touch on I, what I think are the, the three most pertinent for today. Um, number one, always in aviation, of course, is safety. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing in that regard. Uh, government industry collaboration, exceedingly important. Uh, I've, I've been uh, from the very beginning uh, of my tenure, I think we've had an excellent relationship, not just with the FAA and other uh, international organizations like ACAO, uh, but other government agencies as well that obviously have uh, are also stakeholders either because they're using UAS uh, or, or they're needing to, um, uh, to be concerned with um, other elements of that. And then the third element that I'd like to talk about is performance-based regulations. So safety, you know, this is a very, very rapidly evolving industry and it continues to be a, a force for good. Uh, but we have to make sure that we've earned the public trust, as I indicated. Uh, early in my tenure, uh, actually, I walked into and give credit to Michael Toscano, my predecessor, uh, for rolling out a program called the Know Before You Fly program. Uh, and we did this with the Academy of Model Aeronautics and with the FAA. And recently, um, a very important partner is the Consumer Technology Association. Um, basically, what we discovered was that very, very few people who were getting drones, of course, back then you couldn't fly except under exemptions or waivers for commercial purposes, um, actually just under exemptions at that point. Uh, but people that were getting them were largely not aviators or you know, they were people who didn't know a great deal about the airspace. And so, um, so the, the, the information had to, the, had to be disseminated in ways that was easily accessible. Today, we have more than 150 organizations involved in that program. Uh, materials are readily available all the way down to information that comes in the packaging uh, of a drone so that if someone is not an aviator and they don't understand uh, that when they, they get a gift or something along those, those lines that uh, this, this is not just a toy, this is something that is an aircraft and you know, of a certain size can cause real havoc if not uh, operated with great responsibility. Uh, that information is very accessible to them. Move forward to uh, a couple of years later when we were able to, part 107 came out, we were able to start flying under regulations for commercial purposes. What we noticed and our members were talking about was the, the lack of standards by which to train pilots. Some of the pilots that were members of our association had thousands of hours, you know, helicopter pilots, et cetera, um, coming out of the military that were well-trained, et cetera. Some were trying to figure out how to spell part 107 or what that meant exactly and what, you know, what was this thing called the Federal Aviation Regulations. Um, so, you know, what they, what they realized was that we needed to come together and, and agree on some protocols of how we were going to train pilots so that when they were holding out services to the general public, uh, there'd be some way of testing the veracity of what they were saying. Yes, I'm well trained. I'm trained to these standards, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, trusted operator program, we've got a great set of, of, uh, of founding members for that program and increasingly uh, folks are, are recognizing that as sort of a good housekeeping seal of approval uh, for when, when a, a service provider holds out services uh, that, that you can trust that they are trained to a certain skill level. And there are uh, increasing levels of complexity. We have top level one, top level two, and top level three. So again, safety is uh, the most important thing here, the most important principle Ultimately, as we all know, the, the objective is to integrate drones into the airspace with manned aircraft 
And in order to do that, we need to do that without de de degrading the safety levels. So we have to be just as good, if not better than, on, than uh, manned aviation. Second principle I wanna to talk to is collaboration between industry and government. Um, and I think the most important thing that I wanna say and, 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 and repeat it frequently in, in every opportunity that I get is that it's incumbent upon the industry to bring safe solutions forward and demonstrate to the government uh, how they can regulate around this technology. Uh, it, it's, it's not the industry's job to hold out his hand and say, government, please solve our problems for us. Uh, we have to earn our way into the airspace. And, uh, and the way to do that uh, is to respect the incumbents in the airspace and figure out how can, how can we bring solutions that the government can easily implement uh, that, that satisfies their job as regulators to, to do this right. Um, we have a very close relationship with the FAA, a collaborative relationship, uh, probably best demonstrated by the, uh, the fact, and we've just literally announced it, so I'm going to use this platform uh, to, to promote it, that we, we work with uh, in collaboration with the FAA on the FAA UAS Symposium, uh, which we've been doing now for, I think this will be our fifth year. And uh, the uh, last year, of course, 2020, we had to do those in, um, in, 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 virtual, in a virtual format. We will be also in a virtual format this year. Uh, and we, because it's a virtual format, we kind of break it down. Last year, we did episodes one and two. This year, we're going to be doing episode three on uh, June 9th through the 10th and episode four on September the 14th and the 15th. So that's uh, probably the most visible way that we work with the FAA. The FAA largely puts the program together for that because it is their platform to basically talk directly to the community about what it is that it is thinking and, and, and gather feedback. But, it, but we are also increasingly able to put some things on that agenda that we think are really important for them and give them the opportunity to kind of listen to the industry and what the industry uh, is saying that it thinks it can bring to the party. Um, so I, I am, as mentioned, I'm a member of the Drone Advisory Committee, which is a very important group that's been operating now for at least, at least four and a half years. Um, and I'm also on the Management Advisory Council for the FA uh, top leadership, uh, which is uh, extremely important because it gives me some visibility into some of the other challenges that you know that that we are uh, that we're operating inside of, if you will, that that the FA has got to deal with, um, and and um, and uh, that's so that's the DAC and the MAC, and uh, I like to say I'm the only person that's a member of the DAC, the MAC, and the ACK, which is a, a miter group called the Aviation Advisory Committee. Um, so I'm very proud of all of those advisory committee, uh, and every single time I, I'm in those meetings. I'm able to bring something back and feel a little bit smarter about how we're connecting the dots. I also want to mention in the context of, of collaboration between industry and government, the need to get cooperation from other agencies of the government. Uh, and I'm speaking, I could draw this very broadly, but I'm speaking very specifically now of the law enforcement community and the security community. Um, we were, I think, very close to having an NPRM issued several years ago, I want to say as long as three years ago on flight over people um, when it was objected to by members of the law enforcement community. And it was objected on the base, they objected on the basis that they didn't know who was flying the drones. And that all of a sudden became a hurry up on the question of how do we get aircraft, these aircraft, unmanned aircraft systems actually squawking in, in, in uh, when they're flying in the airspace. Now, you could legitimately ask yourself who in the world thought it was a good idea for drones to be flying uh, before they were squawking. Um, but, you know, that's, um, that's I, I would give you a very long winded answer to that. and It wouldn't be a very satisfactory one. Uh, and, and it's not really about blame. It's more about an illustration of how technology tends to move a lot faster than the regulatory process. And that's not that, that, that's not an indictment of the regulatory process. It's deliberative for a very, very good reason. Uh, and sometimes when we think things are moving too slow in a regulatory format, 
it's not because of the regulators, it's because they're following the law and the law makes it be a very deliberative process. So all the more reason that we think through what are the requirements that we need in, in order to do this well, in order to make sure that we're executing uh, in such a way that all of our government stakeholders uh, uh, make sure that they are, are, are satisfied that they are able uh, to do their jobs and uh, to enforce their mandates. The third principle uh, I, I want to relate back, uh, it, it's performance-based regulations, and I want to relate it back to government industry, industry collaboration. Uh, the government sets the goals. This is the way it needs to work uh, in order to let the industry innovate in, uh, in the best ways to get there. Um, it, it, this is a very different approach than our history in aviation where you couldn't fly in an aircraft unless every piece of that aircraft was essentially type cert certificated. And that's probably an exaggeration, uh, but the long and the short is for those of us that are aircraft owners, um, you know, we have to pay attention and for good reason um, when something breaks, whether or not we're, we're putting something in to our aircraft that is airworthy uh, or making it uh, anything less than airworthy uh, according to regulations. We're dealing with an industry that's moving and a technology that's moving so fast that the best example I can think of uh, that has benefited gen general aviation pilots like myself is part 23 reform, uh, where technologies were able to get into the cockpit a lot quicker, get to scale a lot quicker and become more affordable uh, and frankly, make it a lot, lot, lot more safe for us to fly. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of really good examples here, but. Um, but but well beyond, uh, other than my personal experience, well beyond my uh, my knowledge of how they ended up becoming uh, available. I just know that there was a recognition that this technology needed to get into the cockpit quicker in order to get the safety gains. And in some ways, I want to relate to that. I want to relate that to unmanned aircraft systems. If we're operating with performance-based regulations, I think we're going to do fine. There's no such thing as future-proofing what's going on with this technology. Think back on my video, we're gonna miss something. We're gonna miss you know, a way of improving something uh, that, that, uh, that, that will allow us to get to a safer environment and potentially uh, pioneer a technology that would, that would scale faster, that would not only come into the market, but scale faster and become more affordable that might make things more safe throughout the entire aviation system and airspace with all of these new entrants. So, um, so that's, that's basically the third principle that we've been operating on. There's a lot of things coming up. And as I indicated, uh, we've had some really, really good regulatory progress lately in the UAS area. Um, but my simple answer would be we still need to speed up. Um, and you know, I, I'm not I'm not one that 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 vents my spleen like some that you know we're, we're, that things are not moving fast enough and woe is us. But I do think that there's op opportunities for us uh, to again pull things into the market a little bit quicker, uh, and and in some instances that's getting more difficult because we're getting into complex aircraft. Uh, up until now, I would say Part 107 allowed for us to get accommodations to use in the airspace. But to get to true integration into the airspace, uh, we're, we're going to be doing some things that are vastly more complex uh, and are going to require uh, a, a lot more coordination, not just between the FAA and other government agencies, but internally within the FAA itself. And, uh, and, and there are others that understand that much, much better than I do. Um, but to give progress, uh, to give uh, credit where credit is due, uh, remote identification and the operations over people uh, that I mentioned before, both of those are now coming into effect in April, as well as uh, flights at night, um, which in all of these instances, the ideas were uh, for operations over people and at night, uh, it was, okay, there's additional risk associated with that. How do we mitigate that risk? Those things were being done up until now under waivers, but frankly, more and more operations were asking for waivers that's not a sustainable system. And we're really, really pleased to, as I think our colleagues at the FAA are pleased to have that in a regulatory environment now where it's not as labor intensive. Remote identification, 
once it is in, again, this is going to be focused mainly on part 107 type operations. We're going to need something, uh, we're going to need to look at things much more complicated for beyond visual line of sight. Uh, and those things are under consideration. But remote identification uh, is, is uh, the way it's rolling out, I think, offers us the opportunity to give greater visibility to particularly law enforcement on the ground, give them a little bit greater comfort level, sort of like if they need to look up a license plate on a car, uh, this is gonna make that uh, a little bit easier to do. And again, this we would have wished for this to happen faster, but, uh, but I, th I think we're, we're relieved that it's coming out. And I think that will, will help certainly with some of the concerns that we've heard from particularly the law enforcement community. Um, beyond visual line of sight uh, at low altitudes uh, in airspace where air traffic services are not provided. I mean, this is gonna require a lot of collaboration going forward uh, and we're monitoring all those discussions. At the same, same time, we've got, uh, I think, very, very good progress going on that is related to everything like that that's gonna be required for beyond visual line of sight in the area of type certification. The FAA has been certifying larger drones for commercial operations, which is critical to enabling complex UAS operations safely and at scale. And we're starting to see uh, important steps in the right direction to enable uh, commercial drone operations for small UAS uh, as well. I think you know it's hard for me exactly to draw a direct line um, as I kind of did. And again, I'm back to my video. Uh, you know, that was a vehicle where a person was in the vehicle, and of course, he was guiding that uh, through, uh, through his, um, uh, you know, he was actually flying it himself. Uh, but when we talk about urban air mobility and advanced air mobility, you know, we're looking at much, much, much more complex utilization of very similar technologies, but starting to leverage ad additional technologies as well. Um, there's going to be a lot of this in the future, uh, depending upon uh, how, who, whose numbers you want to look at uh, and, and whether or not you've got the courage to actually forecast. Uh, but, you know, 2030, NASA uh, commissioned a market study not long ago that indicates that by 2030, as many as 500 million flights a year uh, will be, uh, we will see for package delivery services. And of course, that's assuming that things are being done beyond visual line of sight. We've demonstrated that that can be done in some of the, um, uh, the pilot projects that were done very recently in places like Blacksburg and, uh, and, and other areas, Blacksburg, Virginia at, at, um, at MAP, um, the Mid-Atlantic Aviation Partnership at uh, Virginia Tech uh, as just one example. It's also been done in other parts around the world. Uh, but to truly get to that level of scale, 500 million flights in a year, um, that you know that's that's going to require a very sophisticated system and regulations, performance-based regulations, where, uh, where where people are able to do that without having to seek a waiver and so forth. Um, I want to wrap up my remarks today with an invitation. I, I've talked a little bit about exponential. Um, we are. Like everyone else, we're kind of dying to get back together face to face so that we can do what it is that we've always done at that show. Again, last time in Atlanta was 2015. Um, and, um, but because we normally do that show in May, uh, we've basically made it a hybrid event. Hybrid event in this instance means almost two completely separate events. In May, we will be doing a virtual event, very robust um, using platforms that we developed last year very successfully for like the FA UAS Symposium and Exponential itself. And some of the, I think we did as many as seven virtual events with thousands of people involved uh, very, very successfully. Um, and then in Atlanta, um, a new program, uh, and, and we will be face-to-face -face with, of course, safety measures in place uh, because even August, uh, where we think it's gonna be safe, we'll still wanna be careful with, um, with, with, with social distance and whatnot, uh, but we're looking forward uh, to doing that back in your city as well. Uh, at that event, you will hear from the end users of the technology, the techno technology 
experts, the designers. Uh, you'll hear from policymakers uh, about their vision for autonomous systems and so forth. Uh, so it's it's going to be a lot of fun, um, and um, we 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 hope to see you face to face then. Uh, undeniable that unmanned aircraft systems uh, is they're moving forward. Uh, they're moving upward. Uh, we, we know they're going to come down safely. Uh, and we're committed as an organization to work with aerospace stakeholders to support the consensus uh, during this era, era of, of true aer aerial renaissance. So it's, it's very, very exciting. Uh, and, and again, we welcome you to join us. Uh, if you're able to come to Exponential, you will be uh, cheek by jail with some of the most innovative and creative thinkers uh, in the aviation world today. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm gonna open it up, uh, give it back to Steve so that we can do questions and answers. Thank you very much, Brian. <clears throat> Amazing uh, information you're giving us. And uh, I know the people watching this are taking notes and listening very carefully uh, from your perspective in Washington and close inside the Beltway view uh, a lot of this is government driven um, missions. And so once they tell us what they want, the innovators will come up with the best ways to do it. Uh, we did have a few questions. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, 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 one of the ones that I think you kind of answered already uh, is which industry do you think has the most untapped potential for drone use? And I think you, you touched on uh, law enforcement. Is there another segment of the industry that you think really uh, is it has the most uh, opportunity for a company that's out there doing drone operations and looking for the economic viability of doing this, maybe non-defense? Well, um, that, that's, a, that's a really, really hard question to answer um, because there are so many choices. Uh, and 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 my, my point was, yes, law enforcement, but I was actually capturing law enforcement under public safety. Um, and uh, public, public safety is a, I, I like using public safety as an example. I mean, there are many, many different elements to public safety. There's, you know, there, there are the firefighters and a whole variety of, of, of different folks uh, that do that. Wildland fires are different than people that are operating in urban areas, but they're both using UAS. Um, law enforcement, yes, um, we've got some great examples there. Uh, emergency responders, um, and we've seen that in, in the wake of, of bad storms and, and so forth, so vitally critical to how to uh, know where to send resources. So it, it's, it's, it's a, it's, I like to use public safety as an example writ large um, for that reason. But the, um, the, the, the ways, the, the different, Vertical industry segments uh, are are all. I mean, they're kind of in a race with each other. And uh, what's fun about the events that we're able to convene is that uh, you know we have people that are from the utility industry that have a big challenge. They they have a lot of high voltage lines, and currently they're they're doing checks of those high voltage lines with large helicopters. Um, maybe not. Well, I shouldn't say large helicopters. With helicopters, I'll say that because I know there's a variety of different those. Um, the um, uh, uh, being able to do horizontal infrastructure inspections uh, and what they're doing with drones, they can learn from the guys at BNSF Railroad who are doing very, very similar things uh, in terms of you know how are you capturing the data, what kind of endurance are you getting from your drones, what kind of photogrammetry are you using. You know what? What kind of software? Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. How are you identifying the problems? Are people like literally looking at inch after inch after inch of rail, uh, like they might be looking at things, or or is there AI that you can apply here uh, that would actually find where there's something where you need to give it human attention? Um, and so, uh, the 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 game that we've been playing is trying to get this cross industry learning going. You know, guys in the oil and gas industry who know a lot about safety uh, can talk with guys in, you know, that are in the in, in the utility industry that are looking at how do I use drones uh, to basically do inspections of a substation, for example, 
and what have they learned over there in the oil and gas industry about flying and wind and so forth and so on. Um, so I didn't answer your question, Steve, because it's really, really difficult. All of these industries are adopting this, this technology very rapidly right. uh, and they're learning from each other. And, and of course, each of these vertical industries, they, they adopt best practices, um, but in some instances, they're learning from other industries to get those best practices in place and accelerating the adoption. Well, as, as you and I have talked, and as you were giving your presentation today and, and our conversation the other day, it really made me realize how many applications, uh, you're just limited by your own imagination as to what can be done with a, a camera, a sensor, or, any, or delivering packages that has the capability to, do, uh, to take off uh, vertically, uh, fly horizontally at, at fairly high speeds, maybe 80 to 100 miles an hour in some cases, or I don't know what the common speed is, you know, that these things would travel. And, and, and then ver when you get to where you're going, vertically either deliver your package or take your picture or, or map an area or, or uh, scan an area for damage uh, in, in the in maintenance, aircraft maintenance, they use uh, dye penetrant and they use various technologies to see if metal's been compromised or cracked. And uh, some of these uh, same type of systems could be used to look at bridges or other infrastructure. How is the helicopter industry, which uh, does some of these jobs, taking the new arrival or the potential impact of the drones uh, I worked with the HAI Association under uh, Matt Zaccaro, and uh, he passed away about two years ago, uh, but a wonderful uh, advocate for the helicopter industry. How are they seeing the uh, implementation of, of uh, these new uh, drone uh, systems? Is that friendly? Um, I, I can't speak for the, the entire industry because I think it's 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 similar to the aviation world in general. I, you know, there, there was a time when, um, when, when UAS were sort of viewed with, with some suspicion. And I think, um, you know, there was, there was cause for that. Um, I, I, and, and it's, you know, I wasn't hired because I was a pilot to do this. I was, I think I was hired because I'm, I'm, you know, because of my advocacy understanding and, and, uh, and, and certainly my enthusiasm for this technology. And the way technology gets adopted, uh, but I, I I think there's probably I'm going to go out on a limb here. And Matt was a good friend of mine, God rest his soul, as well, and did a great job uh, in many industries and in 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 some of the uh, uh, some of the work that we had to do together to to do you know what was going to be registered for drones and things like you know what what level were we dealing with. He was a big supporter of UAS inside of his own industry, but he fought very hard to make sure that there was no degradation of safety for helicopters. And there have been a couple of celebrated incidents where we've had some conflicts. So right. uh, fortunately, there, there hasn't been any loss of, of life yet. Um, but, but there's been, you know, there, there, he had good cause for concern. And, um, and, and the long and the short is, I, I would say that there are probably probably more helicopter pilots today that look at this and say, this is a tool. It's a tool in my, right. you know, in my shed that, or my, you know, in my trunk that I can pull out and use for some applications, but it doesn't negate the use of helicopters. Um, it, it, it makes things that are, you know, I, I, I tend to spend a little bit more time focusing on the applications where someone's hanging from a harness. You mentioned bridge inspections. Um, where that can be done vastly more safely. Yeah. Beyond visual line of sight, un, you know, what's going on under a bridge uh, and increasingly can be done with almost no piloting skills with literally the push of a button uh, to do uh, that inspection and figure out what kind of work needs to be done on that bridge, which is a huge safety matter, particularly oh, yeah. if you're having to close down a, a lane on the bridge to hang somebody underneath uh, to do that inspection. So, you know, you can't do that with a helicopter. Uh, but there are some things that you can do with a drone that you might be doing with a helicopter today. And, and I'm, I, I, I'd be much more comfortable with a helicopter pilot doing that than with somebody who is brand new to aviation. Yeah. 
but we're welcoming all kinds of brand new people to aviation, which ultimately they will become helicopter pilots. Well, we got a few questions in while you were uh, covering some of those topics. And one of the things that uh, I wanted to ask you about was uh, drone, uh, the industry, the unmanned. And somebody pointed out in one of their comments that came in that the, the bathtub was manned. So uh, That's true. we've created an entirely new flying vehicle using electric power that is vertical flight, redundant rotor systems. It's in essence, a new model helicopter, or maybe it's some sort of, it's not really an airplane, but it's a, it's a flying machine. And so uh, how big is the career field going to be? And would you encourage people to get into this uh, as a career field, especially young people right now, since the opportunity, it looks to me is unlimited. Well, um, first off, wh whoever made that comment is absolutely right. That was a manned air yeah, vehicle. Um, and um, <laughs> and, man and man. my point simply in showing that video was, gee, I didn't see that one coming. Um, I mean, I should have seen that one coming. I should have thought somebody would take drone technology, which is what that controller was, uh, and, and, and strap it, you know, drone, to, drone equipment to a bathtub and flat around. Um, uh, again, super MacGyver category, but, um, but yes, this is exactly what we would like, uh, is to have more, and this person, you know, these, these are guys in their young 20, their, their early twenties, I think we want young people to be fascinated by this. Um, and, um, and, and, and many young people clearly are not just young people. A lot of people are fascinated by, uh, the kinds of things that can be done, uh, with this technology. And that was really my point. My point is that the technology, uh, the software to control that particular device, you know, vertical takeoff and landing and things like that, it, it you know, that it was kind of mastered very, very quickly for small UAS. And we should have known that it would, you know, it, within the blink of an eye almost, it would start getting applied to things where people would be getting on board. Now, the next question that is, is naturally asked in that sequence is, well, if, you know, what's the future of unmanned aircraft or urban air mobility, for example, a device that is electric vertical takeoff and landing with people on board that are going from, say, if it's me, it's, you know, Dulles Airport down to downtown DC. Some of the most complex and secured airspace in the world. Um, and, you know, now you've got somebody, uh, is there a pilot on that? Well, initially, of course, there's going to be a pilot on that. But I can promise you those that are that are looking at that scenario out in the future are looking at that as an, as, as an aircraft that will either, either be remotely piloted where the pilot won't be on board uh, or it will be completely autonomous. Right. Don't press me on a timeline for that. Um, and one way or the other, the technical capability is completely divorced from, in my opinion, the public perception of whether or not that is safe. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, it's similar to automated vehicles. It's, you know, I'm not going to get in an automated vehicle if I think, you know, with no steering wheel and pedals, if I think someone can hack that vehicle. So we have to execute that technology in a way that we've earned the public trust. And without the public trust, we're certainly not going to get uh, the, the trust of the regulators and vice versa. Uh, Amy Hudnall is one of our board members and uh, with the Georgia Aviation uh, Centers for Innovation, the Aviation Division. She heads that up and uh, a veteran, uh, very smart about uh, the aviation industry in the state, which is extremely robust. And she asked two questions. One is, how does the battery development, which I assume is what we talked about last week, the uh, lithium ion technology, uh, affecting U.S. UAS incorporation, uh, what develop? How does that impact it? I guess I should say. And then, how long until the beyond visual line of sight regulations become relaxed? Do you think? Um, no, that's two questions. I, 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 I'm trying to remember the year. I think it was in the early '80s when um, when John Glenn was running for the Democratic nom nomination for president. And when, when he was asked the question of if you were president and there was one, one question, you, you know, one issue you could solve, what would it be? And John Glenn was at the end of the line and every, you know, one by one, they went down peace in the Middle East, you know, 
whatever their 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 pet issue was. When they got down to John Glenn, he said, "I'd like better batteries, please." And I thought, you know, that's a that's an interesting statement from a guy who floated around the Earth in in, in essentially what was a tin can. Um, not to take anything away from uh, from those folks, but batteries. We've needed better batteries for everything forever. And in my previous job, and I'm delighted to see the progress that's now being made with vehicle electrification and the development of, of charging stations because it's such marvelous technology. Um, it's two things. It's, it's first off, the energy density of the batteries um, and, and, and finding uh, that, that sweet spot between power and storage and cost and the cost of lithium ion batteries has gone on the, on the vehicle side in the ground, it's gone from $1,000 a kilowatt hour down to, I think we're under $100 a kilowatt hour right. uh, for some of the electric vehicles that are coming out today. That makes drones a lot more, all things that are using batteries a lot more, um, a, a, a lot more affordable and therefore scalable. And this is the economist, the recovering economist in me that's speaking now. But it also, you know, you, you see this not just for drones, more energy density. Obviously, these have got to be safe with lithium ion batteries. And we saw this with the 787. Um, you, you have to worry about dendritic propagation of fire. Uh, they have to be extremely safe and fireproof batteries if we're going to put them on aircraft in larger and larger quantities, which we're now looking at doing for advanced air mobility and electric vertical takeoff and landing. Um, you know, you, you've got to be able to do that in a way that is proven safe. Uh, and now we're seeing that in, in, uh, in ground vehicles in, in increasingly. You also have to charge them very, very quickly. That needs to be done. There are impacts on the grid and so forth. So all of this is advancing cell. very rapidly. I'm well, sorry? Well, we'll uh, you know, this applies to everything that's going to be electric powered. Would Correct. photoelectric cells as a skin, as a uh, 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 some sort of... Uh, coverable uh, material like the wraps you see on buses yep. is the future is that what the future is you have these uh, uh, solar cells these uh, sun catching cells that create uh, the sunlight into energy while an aircraft is in flight enhancing making it uh, giving it longer endurance and duration maybe well, when it just sits on the ground it's charging its own batteries I think enhancing is probably the operative word there. Um, I, you know, it, for for the amount of massive, the massive amount of energy that's that's required to to vertically take off. Of course, we know this from helicopters. Um, you know, for EV tall, you know, that's that's a lot of energy yeah. that needs to be made available. And I, I think it's fair to say, and it's very exciting. Um, and I think John Glenn would be thrilled. Is we're getting to, you know, we're still nowhere as near the energy density of 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 uh, of fuels like gasoline, um, but you know we're getting there. It's 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 getting much more much more feasible to put these in aircraft, and we're starting to see um, you know light trainers that are being completely electrified. And so right, that's it's very exciting. Yeah, uh, uh, Greg Principato, uh, we had some of those uh, come up in discussions at the National Aeronautics Association, and some of the records. I'm trying to think if it was the Lindbergh challenge, I'm not sure which, but it was a two hour flight from a fully uh, electrified aircraft with two passengers, 200 miles and uh, uh, nonstop. And it, they're doing it. This was two or three years ago. So uh, this technology is, is rapidly making its way in. You know, I, I, I don't know if you read this uh, magazine, it's called uh, Kit Planes and uh, Mark Cook uh, I, interestingly, after we spoke, he wrote an article uh, in this month's issue, droning around uh, the future, or droning about the future, and he muses through this article about where does where do the lines blur between the big manufacturers of Boeing and, and Airbus that are making these massive uh, urban mobility vehicles and, and probably other uses too, to the home builder which comes mm -hmm. down to the kit plane market. And then in here, he quotes Jack Pelton uh, frequently as being very interested. And, and as a pilot, I don't know if you've been to Oshkosh uh, last few years, but about five years ago, Jack Pelton's vision for that organization is, is reaching down into the younger age groups. And uh, the drone technology really 
fascinates them, maybe even in a different way than uh, flying airplanes, because it's different. Uh, it's a different dynamics of flight, different physics uh, required. So they have an entire drone area of Oshkosh. Ha have you been up there to see that? I have, yeah. I have You've seen that area. It's very exciting, and you know, whatever it takes to to hook young people, we we you know we need we need more pilots, we need more mechanics, we need more designers, um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 very exciting to to see them, you know, start to really fire uh, the imagination. How how would a young person get started? And is this field inclusive and and welcoming to a diverse group from male, female? Uh, any any background, any race, anyone, it would be totally inclusive to everyone that has an interest in this technology. This would, would do you think this would be a good career field for these young people to follow? And how Absolutely. would they, they get more information, do you think? Absolutely. And, and from the AVSI board on down, we are committed uh, to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and, um, and, and for many, many years, we have been reaching out through our foundation now called Robo Nation uh, and largely through competitions that are run actually all over the world, not last year, but, um, but they're starting to come back online soon. And that's the, the whole idea is to try and get more and more folks interested uh, across the board. And we are uh, working very, very hard now uh, to develop a, a, a greater pool of interest uh, by, by partnering with some of the other organizations that are doing similar things, but for potentially uh, under underserved communities and so forth. So it's a very deliberate, very intentional effort on our part. So what I'm taking from that is this is a great field to get involved in. It's going to grow like mad. If you love aviation in any or in every form, like most of us, uh, this may be proved to be a very great, uh, a very good place to, to get your career started, or maybe even to make your career. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit uh, some folks out at Phoenix Air this week, and I want to thank uh, the Phoenix Air team for hosting the uh, myself and, and uh, some others uh, last a uh, few days ago, uh, and for showing us your operations, including your drone division, which uh, is run uh, exceptionally well and uh, amazing technology. Uh, do you think the price point of these uh, these uh, systems will come down as we see larger numbers of them? No question about it. We, we um, you know, we, we, we need a, a more robust uh, system of, of, you know, I, I would say particularly on the domestic side of things, we need a more robust supply chain and value chain. Um, a lot of that is a function of, of getting regulations where we can start moving to scale. Uh, and um, you know, we, we have all of the innovation that's required and all of the manufacturing capability that's required to do this and scale it out here. Uh, and I'm very, very optimistic about our prospects for doing that. And so are the members of the industry. Well, it's, it's what usually happens with our, our luncheon series here. And, and Brian, we're gonna invite you to come join us in person. Like you said, we're just dying to get back around other human beings again. Uh, and so we'll have you in person uh, in, with our group uh, and enjoy some of the famous uh, saltine crackers of the Capital City Club, which are spiked with uh, butter, hot butter, I might add. It's pretty, pretty addictive. But uh, we're, we're out of time. It's uh, uh, already we're past time. And uh, yeah, to, out of respect to you and our, our, our viewers, is there any, uh, can you want to give us your contact information, how people could reach you after this event? Uh, after this webcast? Of course, it, very, very simple. It's, it's B-W-I-N-N-E at A-U-V-S-I dot O-R-G. So, um, but by all means, um, send, send folks a link to my video, to that video um, and, uh, you know, have, have them, uh, have them reach out to me. I'd be delighted to answer any further questions. And in this video, uh, once we finish with this, uh, we'll, we'll post it on our website, the Atlanta aeroclub.org and also at avbuyer.com. Uh, uh, so uh, you'll see that it probably take a week or so to do that. But I wanna thank everyone for being here. Mm -hmm.